Today's scripture lesson is from Acts, second chapter, verses 42 through 47. Reverend's being gentle on me because I told him, don't give me one of those long ones. <laughs> and I left that old one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Do these words our God is still speaking. Thanks be to our still seeking God. As you know, we are now almost coast to coast. I have my one daughter in Virginia, and now my brother in California, who's watching us all soon. Oh, welcome, David. So we are very community-wide. It's clear, as I just read in Acts 2, the members of the church depended on one another. They were unified and interconnected. As a church today, we depend on one another. We're a family. I depend on you for an example of holiness, for enthusiasm about what we're doing together, and for a shared passion about touching people in the love of Jesus Christ. You know, I remember a Southern Baptist church that I was sent to as a candidate for the position of youth pastor when I was in seminary. Soon I introduced the congregation before the service, and I was supposed to be in the governing body after the service was over with. And the service reached that point where they were ready to partake of Holy Communion. We were advised from the congregation that because we were not baptized in, nor a member of this congregation, we could not come to the table. Kind of an embarrassing situation. I did not meet with the governing body of that church after church. In fact, uh, the reason I told them was that I felt it was very exclusive. That's the way they presented the table. And also, there's also a great lack of hospitality. And I wish them luck on our search for a pastor. There was nothing said when I was sent to the seminary to this church in Kevin. They had restrictions about who could and could not partake of the Lord's table. There was nothing said to prepare me or Sue for being pointed out from the congregation as outsiders. But Edmonds, former pastor of the church in Elmira, New York, also tells the story of what he feels it was like to be denied hospitality. He and his wife were vacationing one summer and decided to worship a prominent church near Washington, D.C. Apparently this church had quite a reputation for the quality of their preaching and corporate worship. And the reputation held up. According to Bob and Susan, <laughs> I didn't plan this, that's just what their names were. <laughs> they held up that standard. The sermon was really, the music was inspiring. That much didn't disappoint them. What it did was the lack of hospitality. The very moment they arrived at church, at no time did anyone speak to them. Or welcome them to the church, except for the pastor. He did give them a people a tip on their way out the door after church. No one directed them to the nursery, they had to find it themselves. No one invited them to the fellowship hall for coffee and refreshments afterwards, they had to find that themselves. In fact, Bob deliberately stood in this humongous chandelier hanging in the middle of this huge hall, looking at it, being as conspicuous as possible, and, and not one person approached him to ask him his name or anything else. He says, we felt as though we were invisible. No one even noticed we were there. I don't care how good the preaching or music were, nothing could have made up for their lack of hospitality. That church was as cold and lifeless as a corpse. There may be some of us here who have stories about churches they've attended in the past before finding a home here at Polk Road. It's strange that there still are churches today 
They make it hard to experience God in community. Have you ever wondered what the church was like in the early days? Justin, the Christian apologist, has given us a description of that Sunday service at his small church in Rome around A.D. 150. According to Bard Thompson, who's the editor of the Liturgy's Western Church from uh, Meridian Books 1962 on that day, which is called Sunday, he says, all who live in the cities or in the countryside gather together in one place. The memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as there is time. Then when the reader has finished, the present and the discourse admonishes and invites the people to practice these examples of virtue. They all stand together and offer prayers. And as we mentioned before, they have finished the prayers. Bread is presented in wine with water. The friend likewise offers prayers and thanksgiving according to his ability. And the people assent by saying, Amen. Those which have been uh, blessed are sure to receive by each one. They are sent to the absent of the deacons of the home communion. Those who are prosperous, if, prosperous if they wish to tribute what each one deems appropriate. And the collection is deposited with the present. And then takes care of the orphans and widows. And those who are needy because of sickness or other causes. And the captives and the strangers who sojourn among us. In brief, he is a curate of all who are in need. You know, life seems to be construed that it's our nature to need one another. To walk together with one another. And this is seen in the way that we band together as families and as friends and as congregations. In a way, we turn to one another in times of sorrow and joy. In a way, we celebrate life's high moments and share the experience which are meaningful to us. And if we are Christians, those who have been together as dimensions of a meaning never found anywhere else. Long ago, Jesus said, Come to me. And believing in him, people came. But this isn't just all they did. As it's written in Acts 2.44, they who believed were together. Not only did they come to him, they also got together with one another. They were mutually encouraged by the faith of one another and drew strength in the fellowship they shared. Just like we do here. That Paul wrote to one of his churches, I thank God wherever I think of you, whenever I think of you, and when I pray for you, my prayers are always joyful because of your good fellowship and the gospel of Christ from the first day until now. My dear friends, if we are all sincere about this business of Christian living, there is no way to describe the values that there are for us in being together, in fellowship, in shared experience, in the adoration of worship of God. Just as the description is one of an intimate and joyful act of thanksgiving, one done not individually, but in community. He doesn't speak of isolated worshipers independently interacting with the priest, each to his or her own separate list of, or, or uh, yeah, separate little bland tasting wafer or mini cup of juice. Never cast a glance at the person beside him or behind him or in front of him. Justice is describing a corporate experience here, a communion of community. The action of an intimate group of believers, and perhaps even non believers, or others struggling to believe or to search out their faith, who all share together, pray together, live together eat and drink and give thanks together. Because right back to Susan, you know, when the prayer circle after church, that's what they did. They're active, not passive, in their ministry as a body of Christ. They have a sense of who they are together as a family of God. You know, generally we speak of a great church. 
We do that when you have a church that has a great set of facilities, where it has an eloquent preacher, where it has an exceptional music program, or finally perfected organizational life. A church, however, well, can be great without having any of these things. Oh, we missed the music. Pretty awesome. Well, just a preacher. <laughs> Any church can be a great church. It has the qualities and characteristics which were found in the church described in Acts 2. William Willman, in worship and past, as pastoral care, printed by Abbott Press in 1979, makes some sharp observations. As you've heard it said, the family that prays together stays together. I say to you, the family that eats together stays together. Could a contemporary breakdown of many of our families be attributed to our families so rarely eating together? Little wonder that love and unity are difficult for us. We cannot share something even so basic as bread. Think about that for a minute. And if meal times are basic to unity and maintenance of human families, how much more basic is this table fellowship than the family of God? Something sacred happens to people who have shared food and drink. Think about our gathering in fellowship hall where we share a meal. And the intimacy, the intimacy of that, that fellowship and joining together. We're no longer individuals, we are a community. You know, immediately after fighting stopped in World War II. American soldiers gathered up many hungry and homeless children and placed them in tent cities. Many of them were malnourished and in need of medical care. The soldiers gathered together bread and gave it to them. Harvard soldiers noticed that the children were afraid to go to sleep at night. And one of the soldiers tried to experiment. After dinner, he gave each of the children a piece of bread. The results were astounding. They all slept like babies. When they had that security of bread for tomorrow, they slept like babies. It took the fear away. Bread, not as simple as bread. There's a surplus of meaning in that word. The word goes strong in most of security, fellowship, the presence of God, provisions for the journey. <clears throat> bread is deemed holy by peoples everywhere. And the root word for bread in most languages can be translated food, as it is in the Bible. A church is a family. We are a family. We look out for each other. We care about each other. We're a family. We're not just a group of people gathered together. A hundred years ago, Reverend Charles E. Jefferson described the, the difference between an audience and a church. I remember a church I went to in Akron. We all may have known it years ago, the Crystal Cathedral. You all remember that church? Rex Humbard. That was an audience. I was there to witness. But here's just an audience and a crowd. An audience is a crowd. A church is a family. An audience is a gathering. A church is a fellowship. An audience is a collection. A church is an organism. An, audi organism, uh, an audience is a heap of stones. A church is a temple. And he concludes, preachers are not ordained to attract an audience. We are here to entertain you. We're here to build a church. I hope that everyone in this room understands that critical difference. If a business, nonprofit organization, or political party is torn with dissension, it's a shame. We see that right now. But when the church of Jesus Christ is in turmoil, it's a tragedy. Because Christ depends on us and our unity. Recognize other believers as brothers and sisters in the family of God. The Christians in Jerusalem shared all they had. 
so that all can benefit from God's gifts. It's tempting sometimes, especially if we have material wealth, to cut ourselves off from one another. Each taking care of his or her own interests. Each providing for, for joy and, and for enjoyment of his or own little piece of the world. But as a part of God's spiritual family, it's our responsibility to help one another in every way possible. God's family works best when its members work together. I hear an amen on that. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Amen. Thank you. Reverend Jane Merrick shared the story he heard about a five-year-old boy who fell out of bed. His cries were making the entire household. After his mother had safely tucked him back in the bed under the cover, she says, why did you fall out of bed? <laughs> Between the tears of sobs, he said, well, I guess I went to sleep too close to where I got in. <laughs> Far too many Christians make that same mistake. They fall out of bed of life and go to heaven. Did they slept too close to where they got in? They never learned the difference between union and communion. He said in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. When you trust Christ, you become a branch in his vine. That is union. But he goes on to say in verse 5, He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Now that is communion. Union is the basis of communion. To abide in Christ, the 24 hour a day, 7 day a week, 52 week a year, intimate fellowship with him. So that you become a fruit bearing branch. John Sumwall, later when the INS shelter program, the homeless started in uh, Kenosha, he signed up the training program to be a volunteer. He says, after I was trained, I was assigned a three-hour shift on a Sunday night at Lord of Life Lutheran Church, several blocks from, the, from up the street from my own congregation. My shift was from 8 in the evening to 11 p.m. I helped the register the homeless persons, as they arrived, each person received a foam pad or a mattress, a small pillow, a sheet, and a blanket. As they re received their gear, we took them into the fellowship hall where they were to sleep on the floor. There was a row of tables dividing the room, men on one side, women and children on the other. But there were no children at that evening. There was one young woman who was in her late stage of pregnancy and before the shift was over. Labor pain started and she had to be removed by ambulance to the hospital. It says that all about 25 persons came to that shelter on that cold of every year. Most of them were young men in their 20s and 30s. It was evident that they all knew each other. Probably because they sheltered together before on the streets and in churches after the ends program began. A few of the men were quiet and kept to themselves, but several of them gathered around this large African-American man named Bill, who seemed to be kind of the leader in the group. They shared a, a warm camaraderie that was a joy to behold. They didn't have homes and, in most cases, jobs. But they had each other. They clearly enjoyed one another's company. About 10 o'clock, I went to the kitchen to pop some popcorn and distribute snacks that had been provided by members of churches participating in the program. Almost everyone came to get a cookie and a cup of coffee and then went back to the tables where some of the men engaged in a game of cards. Bill brought an apple pie. He said he purchased from among the day old items at one of the bakers. He cut the pie up and began to shoot pieces to all his friends. I stood there watching hunger, hoping he might offer me a piece too. I felt guilty about my feelings because I knew I could go home in a couple hours I did anything I want, a well-stocked pantry. So there I stood looking on. Envious of their fellowship, I wallowed in my suburban yucky boots. Bill must have sensed my hunger. It was just then he looked up and he asked, Would you like to have a spot? And I eagerly said yes and quickly joined him and the others. <laughs> it felt very good to be included in their group. So I ate my pie and joined the conversation. 
I became aware that we were sharing what our Lord Jesus called the bread of life. And I knew I was in his presence. Blessed be the tie that binds. We have sung that often, haven't we? We should know it by heart to every verse. Well, there is such a tie. And it is blessed. In primitive church, that tie was very strong. The, the first Christians were an island community in a vast, hostile sea. Fellowship was precious. And there was strength in it. The follower of Christ meeting a stranger on the road, not knowing if that stranger was a Christian or not, or from some hostile camp, would often use his staff to make the sign of a fish or a cross in the dust at his feet. Watching for a reaction from the other. The stranger registered no reaction. Were these secret signals? Then the conversation moved to casual channels. And soon each person went on their way. But that sign was identified. There was an embrace and a great rejoicing that there on the road, a Christian had met a Christian. Oh, how these people needed one another. However much that fellowship meant to them. Should our fellowship with one another mean any less to us today? In worship together, we share the fellowship which is ours in Christ. And we give thanks to God for our fellowship of this faith whom He has given to us. With whom we can travel a while, and of whom strength we can partake as we walk beside us along our way each day. Today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. Today we come together with Christians around the world, across our own country, in community, as we join at the Lord's table. For in Christ there is no east or west, there is no north or south, but one great fellowship throughout the whole wide world.